What's up guys, it is Dan from Fight Wave and today I'm joined by somebody I'm very excited to speak with. If you know anything about me, you know I love speaking to people not just who are fighters, but who are embedded in the fight game in every aspect of the word. You know, today's guest is somebody who is no exception to that, a phenomenal coach, and in my opinion, somebody you should be keeping a tentative eye on for maybe coach of the year or MMA spokesperson of the year. I feel like he's been a great ambassador for mixed martial arts as of the past year or so. His gym, Goat Shed, has done unbelievable things in terms of becoming one of the most chaotic yet successful gyms. You know, some call him President Awesome, some call him Dana Brown. He just became the president of Karate Combat. I'm joined by Awesome Zaidi. How are we doing today, my brother? It's a pleasure. That introduction was, uh, was unbelievable. I appreciate you very much, man. Happy to be on. Thank you, man. The pleasure is all mine. And man, when you have someone as busy as yourself, you know, any chance to get a time to speak with you is time well taken. You know, I got to talk to you first and foremost. It's been such a busy year. You look at the growth of your gym, Goat Shed, you know, over social media, over fighters, you know, one of the most active gyms, I think, in the country right now. And then also you look at what you've been doing with Karate Combat, wasting no time as president. Anthony Pettis versus Benson Henderson 3, one of the biggest fights of the year. Talk to me about how everything's been just balancing everything together and getting so many stuff or so many things on the ball rolling. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, man. You know, like, I guess when, when you're just living the MMA life, you don't realize um, how many connections you have or how many people you know. And uh, when they elected me as president, they said, okay, make our card for Las Vegas. What's, what main event do you want? And it was crazy. that The day I became president was the day we made that, that fight. That was the first fight we made. And, um, man, I mean, everyone, everyone absolutely loved it. You know, I'm getting, like, a lot of criticism from, like, traditional martial artists because they're upset that I'm bringing guys with different backgrounds. Like, for instance, Perez has a Taekwondo background, Benson also. So some traditional martial artists are, are a little upset at that. But by the end of the product, they'll see um, the benefit it had for karate. Yeah, definitely. Like, for me, I feel like when you put together a main event like that, uh, even despite, you know, the, the whatever background they come from initially, I feel like it's just overall a massive benefit to the sport. You look at what Karate Combat has been able to do in such a short time. You know, people kind of looking at it almost as like an alternative to bare knuckle boxing in some case. You know, some people are like, oh, bare knuckle is a little too much for me. Karate Combat's kind of the better alternative. But more importantly, you look at the ambassadors surrounding it, like Boss Rutten and Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. It's got a lot of merit as, you know, as a combat sports promotion. Talk to me a little bit about assuming the role of president, what that meant for you when they came to and say, hey, awesome, we want you to take over the reins and, you know, make something special of this promotion. So talk to me a little bit about that. Well, my main thing was to, to shake it up and, and get the combat sports world involved. Because already, Karate Combat had such crazy viewership. I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable. They were one of the most viewed organizations in the world. And my idea was when I step in, okay, let me get the combat sports community involved a little more. Let's get some big names out there and uh, start evolving the sport in, in that direction. You know, and, and I think that's why the MMA world is absolutely fascinated. I mean, I'm getting calls from, you know, Eamon Zabi, Fraz Zahabi. I'm getting calls from some of the biggest names, Henry Cejudo. I'm getting calls from some huge names in the MMA world that are so intrigued. Dean Thomas now is coming out uh, for our show. So big names that are so intrigued with what we're doing here at Karate Combat. That was objective. No, yeah, definitely. And I feel like, you know, when you have so many guys coming out and wanting to, you know, just be a part of something, it really says how special it is. And I feel like your whole, you know, this whole year has kind of been you proving the doubters wrong. You know, when they say you can't do it, you've really been able to do it. You know, the, a perfect example of that is the success with Goat Shed. You know, you look at how big the gym has become over the past year. And it's become a hotbed for a lot of UFC fighters to come through. Maybe some even switching gyms. Talk to me a little bit about this unprecedented, not unprecedented success, but this, you know, this driving force behind trying to prove the doubters wrong. And, and getting to where you've gone. Because Goat Shed, in my opinion... It's in the makings for a big 2024. You look at how many UFC fighters already are coming there and staying there. How many guys are coming up? I feel like it's the, the sky is the limit for that gym. The, the guys out of there are off the charts, some of them. No, I appreciate you, man. Yeah, go, go Chet completely skyrocketed. To imagine that three years ago, or sorry, about four years ago, we had one professional fighter and three amateurs. And now we got 34 professional fighters, maybe another 20 amateurs than another few hundred students, you know? So it definitely skyrocketed in a very short time. You know, we have many UFC fighters now on the mat on a daily basis that are representing our gym. So it's funny though, as far as you talking about the doubters, I mean, they always said something, right? So before it was like, oh, they'll never win an amateur title. We win all the amateur titles. They'll never win in the pro leagues. Okay, we, we went undefeated our first year as pros. 
oh, they'll never make it to, you know, a different organization. We went to Combate Global. Finally, we got into UFC. They said we would never make it to, we got into UFC. We're winning in UFC. Now they're like, but they have no UFC champs. So they're always going to say something. You know what I mean? But we're so far above that. And to be honest, I think this whole, um, you know, idea of getting into karate combat and, and becoming president and taking on this type of role, um, it's brought on so much credibility on our side as a, as a fight team as well to see that we're doing things the right way, that all the doubters are kind of gone. I don't hear any of those things anymore. I don't, I don't see the haters anymore. What can they say at this point? You know, the amount of success is absurd. The wins speak for themselves. So there's nothing to be said but to praise Goat Shed and Karate Combat. No, yeah, definitely something I really saw throughout the course of the year was kind of that narrative change. You know, you look at the beginning of the year, people were really talking about Goat Shed, like, oh, what, what is this gym? And then you look at the end of the year and everyone's praising it. You know, even, even going as far as saying it's one of the best gyms in Miami, I think it's easily top three right now. I don't think that, that it's contestable, you know. You've got, in my opinion, with the year that Goat Shed has had, you got Kilcliff FC, you got Amer American top team Coconut Creek, and you've got Goat Shed. I feel like just in terms of natural progression, the gym has gone so far in such a short span of time, it's hard to discredit what you've Yeah, and the thing is, one thing that's very important to know that Kill Cliff and uh, ATT, American Top Team, those are two, one of, two of my favorite teams in the world. But they're in North Florida. They're so far gone. They're not in Miami. You know what I mean? My, my 3,000 square foot gym costs more than their gym. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's very different, uh, the lifestyle in Miami. When you talk about top teams in Miami, it's only us. Because the only other team in Miami is MMA Masters. And MMA Masters has like a 60, I think 67% losing ratio right now. Like it's, it's so insane when you look at stats. People don't realize that they've been around 20 years. So people don't realize what the numbers are. But when you look at it, and I think it's actually, I just checked, the 62, 62% losing ratio. They lose six out of 10, oh, 10 wow. of fights. That's crazy, man. But that's Miami. Um, when you talk about Kill Cliff and HC, those teams are unbelievable, and they're they're super gyms. You know what I mean? I'm a, I'm a three thousand square foot gym um, with with a great fight team, but those guys have what like a hundred fighters, hundred fifty. It's a it's a giant factory of a gym. It's a dream gym, but it's it's, it's a very different brand than what I'm going for. Right? We're, we're sort of the the filthy few, the small elite team, chaotic environment. Right? They're that giant factory gorgeous unbelievable gym you know in north florida it's a different different setting no yeah definitely i feel like like you mentioned it's like they've also got backing from sponsors different money to play around with whereas you i feel like you come from humble beginnings in a sense you know you look at kind of how you how you came up you know you look at your way making it up the mma ladder to becoming someone whose you know presence demands respect i feel like now you know you look at a lot of people questioning your merit as a coach but I feel like over this year, you've really shut people down. I feel like that is kind of the saying surrounding Awesome Zaidi, Chef Awesome, Dana Brown is, is proving those doubters wrong. You know, you've done a great job in doing so, and you've com commandeered the respect of the entire M MMA community, even garnering praise from coaches like Eric Nixick and a lot more, just to, and just to name Eric as one of them. You know, talk to me a little bit about that reception changing around you from people criticizing and attacking your merit as a coach to now recognizing, look, we were quick to jump the gun, and you got guys like Eric coming at you coming out singing your praises and you know respecting you for what you have been able to build in such a short time no it's it's awesome and you know always the big name coaches were always supporting us you know if you ask Faraz Zahabi about me if you ask Sean Danaher if you ask uh, Hensel Gracie Hoyce Gracie if you ask uh I mean any of these guys they're gonna absolutely praise and now we got Eric of course from Extreme Couture so some of the biggest names have always praised us the thing is with the smaller coaches the reason they were so mad is because we made an impact so fast that it almost felt undeserving it's like yo these guys just opened up how are they making more noise than us it's not fair and then they would lash out and make their comments and make their excuses as to why they're not getting the attention that they think that they deserve you know but over time it's like okay you're 104 wins 11 losses that's our team right 104 professional wins 11 losses 90 percent win ratio it's like there's no denying it and then the greatest minds in the sport dean thomas put out a video and said that if he wishes Goat Shed existed while he was fighting. If Goat Shed existed while he was fighting, he'd be fighting for us. That's what that's Dean Thomas, man. So some of the greatest names in the sport are, are absolutely in love with what we've built. And it, there's just no denying it. We just needed the wins to back it up. Because before, you had this bald, bearded, crazy dude screaming. That was about it. But now it's like, oh, you got over 100 professional wins to back up all your words. So that's why nobody's saying anything. And that's why there's so much support. 
and we're visiting all these different gyms. I'm bringing my guys to spar all across the nation, and people are getting to experience it live, and people are saying, wow, these guys have a great level. And we're making connections with all these different gyms. Like Extreme Couture, I have an unbelievable relationship with. You know, like really, like it feels like a home gym to me, you know? No, yeah, definitely. For me, what I love is, like you mentioned, you know, if you if you would have looked a while back, they would have said, who's just this crazy guy who's who's doing these things? But I feel like you, like you said, you know, you got to be able to evolve in the fight game. I feel like that's a very important thing. And I feel like a lot of these uh, coaches in the United States, they kind of just don't understand how much the impact of social media has taken, where, of course, you can have good results. There's probably plenty of gyms with similar, if not, you know, identical or maybe a little bit worse results than Goat Shed. But they're not marketing themselves the right way. They're not putting themselves out there to be able to build on. I feel like part of being able to get to that to that massive number or something that at least aids it a little bit more is being able to market yourself correctly. And I feel like you, the way that you've tackled the social media front of it and the way that you've done, people like to talk down on it. People like to criticize it. But I feel like it's easily one of the most effective ways to grow your brand and outlet. And that's, I feel like, your inner entre entrepreneur taking over. Your inner, not just coach, but inner entrepreneur where you understand, hey, I need to do these things a certain way to be able to, to speed run this or maybe be able to accelerate this. So talk to me a little bit about being able to, to grow your numbers, being able to grow the influence that you have in the space and just being able to market yourself correctly. Because I feel like that's such an important thing in this day and age, not to be able to, not just to be able to coach, but also be able to market and pass that advice on to your fighters, what they should be able to do, how they should be able to grow their platforms if they're coming up. No, definitely. I mean, and that idea led to like such a life changing opportunity with karate combat. You know what I mean? If, if I didn't go through all of that and I didn't really put myself out there and, and was outspoken, I would have never been able to earn uh, a position as great as this, you know, but I think in the future, you're going to, see all MMA coaches doing what I'm doing you know it's gonna evolve 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 and soon I'll be left in the past too right like I, I make fun of some older MMA coaches for not being with the times I mean eventually it's the same thing is gonna happen to me in 20 years you know there's gonna be guys that are gonna outgrow me and, and take it to the next level but for me it, it was really tough you just I couldn't care what everyone had to say I had to put myself out there over and over and and throw all the chips on my guys every single fight go all, all in and um and really work hard for our results, you know, to, to make sure I can back up those words. Eventually, I mean, it led to this, man. This is this is one of the greatest things that I could have ever asked for in my life. I've always known I wanted to be a president of a major organization. I thought it was going to be after I'm done coaching. I didn't think it was going to be right now. But to have it right now and have it be at this moment, I mean, it's the biggest honor. I actually, I thank myself. Actually, I text the founder randomly all the time, like, thank you, man. And and he, he never, like, he doesn't know how to think how to show love. So I always text him, like, thank you, man. I love you. And he doesn't say anything back. <laughs> but I'm, so, I'm just so appreciative of life, man. This is so fucking awesome. And stepping in at this time, and now we got this Las Vegas event, the biggest event in the history of karate combat. I mean, it's huge, man. It really is. And I feel like December 15th, everything is going to change for the world of striking, for combat sports. I feel like momentum going into 2024 with karate combat is going to be insane. No, you say that. I agree. You know, because you look at Bare Knuckle, they just needed one big event to really garner that respect. I feel like it's going to be the same thing with karate combat. I feel like this event, if all if it goes how we expect it to go, it's going to be revolutionary, I think, for the space. But more importantly, you know, you look at even just revolutionary for the space. You mentioned earlier, you know, just being able to keep proving the doubters wrong, building and building on what you've been able to do. Two particular highlights of this year that stand out to me is just the two moments. I feel like when you got a great coach, you got you got a polarizing coach, you got polarizing fighters as well, and it, it's it would be hard to interview and not bring up. The, you know the Eileen Perez fight against Lucy Padalova. Yeah. You know, probably one of the biggest moments of 2023 coaching wise. Um, talk to yeah. me a little bit about the fight week with Eileen, and also not even just Eileen, but also the fight week with Francisco. I feel like that's another one that went under the radar. A great young talent, somebody who, in my opinion, has done remarkable things throughout his young career thus far. What's it meant for you to be able to travel with them, be able to go with them to the apex, and just see them perform and how they've been able to do in 2023 thus far? Because Francisco, beginning of the year. UFC 284 goes goes over to Australia. Young kid doesn't even speak a lick of English, but goes there, puts on a valiant display. Next fight against Altman Azidar, put on one of the best young performances, a uh, uh, young fighter performances of 2023. Talk to me a little bit about just your how your fighters have been, what it's meant to you, and being able to go with them for these moments. Yeah, this is this is gonna be a really cool conversation actually. So let's start with Francisco, right? So Francisco, I got about I would say. 
15 to 18 weeks before the fight. Okay. And I was training him. And when he got to my gym, he was, he was 20 years old, 20 year old UFC fighter. It's crazy. He was 12 and one at the time. And, um, he wasn't doing so great in his rounds. His issue was the same as that fight, the Malarkey fight, where he would get taken down and held down. So in my gym, often you get taken down and held down the whole round, and he wasn't winning his rounds. It was, it was a big problem. So the thing about him is he learns so quickly, and he spends so many hours with me. I'm talking about he'll spend five, six hours a day training with just me. Then you got your strength and conditioning, and you got whatever else he does. But with me personally, five, six hours a day. I'm teaching him two privates a day like that. And eventually starts winning his rounds now about i think it was like 12 weeks before the fight the manager comes to me and says this is our opponent i say whoa 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 whoa, whoa. are you crazy like you're gonna put him again uh, against otman are, like are you nuts the guy is i think he was 13 and one with 13 first round finishes like 12 knockouts and one submission like something crazy like he's finished all of his opponents and i'm like are you nuts we have a 20 year old kid here and he's like man it's the ufc we can't say no to opponents and i'm like okay all right, 12 weeks to get this 20-year-old to beat this freaking animal. The guy's, the guy's in private jets. The guy's uh, driving Rolls-Royce Cullinans. He's in the camp with Khabib, Islam Makhachev. He's with Ali. He's with, like, some of the greatest. All my heroes. Like, all my heroes, that's who the guy's with. He's in a mansion with all of them. You know what I mean? With a barber inside, and they have training camps in their mansion. Like, And we're going to compete against that, my little 3,000-square-foot gym. So I'm, I'm, I'm spazzing out as a coach, you know? And I remember being home and I wake up like one night, like it was like 3 a.m. I wake up and I wake up my wife and I said, I got it. I fucking got it. Francisco's winning this fucking fight. I swear to God, Francisco's winning this fight. And she, she got super excited because I was always, I was a nervous wreck, you know? I started drilling this game plan and I'm, I'm going far into this. I got statistics. I got, I filming, uh, I'm doing everything it takes to get scientific about this match. And we find this commonality. That Otman makes in every single fight. We saw a big mistake he makes when he defends takedowns. He de he defends it with double underhooks. He drops both his hands, both his hands to defend takedowns when he gets shot on the wall. So our idea was we were going to shoot five, six times in the first round to get the guy to continuously drop his hands, right? So he gets this confidence that he thinks he's defending our takedowns, but we don't really want the takedown. We're just faking. And by the fifth or sixth takedown, finally, we were going to fake and do different attacks. We had a number of attacks we were going to do. Now, watch the fight. The commentators are like, ah, oh, man, Francisco needs to work on his wrestling. He has pretty terrible wrestling. But they didn't know. We didn't want to wrestle. It was all fake. All we wanted were, were his hands to drop. And we shot and shot and shot. And when it started dropping, I, I screamed out, he's ready. He spun, spinning elbow, knocked him out, done. First round knockout, 20-year-old UFC fighter knocks out a freaking, just an animal. An animal from my favorite camp in the world. Like, my favorite people in the world is that is that guy's friends. You know what I mean? So it's just, like, such an honor. And they were so humble, and they embraced us, and we were so cool. Because in reality, I want to work with those guys. You know, that side of the world, I, I want to go there. I want to send my fighters there. I want to train with them. I want to get involved with them. So to compete against them and them being so humble with that loss and, and giving us our credit, it, it was an amazing experience. And, and no one can deny us after something like that. That has to be the greatest victory Goatshed ever had, without a doubt. Then you're talking about Eileen Perez. That was the first fight I cornered as president of Karate Combat. So it was, it was pretty cool because it's like, man, there's no president of any organization in the world that's cornering in the UFC or cornering the highest level matchups. Usually the president doesn't even, doesn't even practice martial arts. I, I probably I probably am the only president that actually coaches at the world scale, I would think. And uh, after Eileen, you know, she had a super dramatic fight week. I don't know if you remember, she got punched, sucker punched uh, the week of her fight. Yeah, by Jocelyn, and her eye swelled up real big. And we used the N-swell every day. We were just squeezing that eye to, to get the swelling to reduce. But in the first round of the fight, her eye swelled back up, shut. And the, the strategy had to change completely. We were planning on striking. We wanted to knock this girl out. And instead, we had to start shooting takedowns. So, you know, we shot takedowns, and we, we did what we had to do to win the fight. It wasn't the most exciting performance, but, but I think what was special about it is Eileen didn't make any excuse. She didn't pull out. Most most people would have pulled out of that fight. You know, she didn't pull out. She fought despite this giant swollen eye, which which is still damaged right now. And um, she showed something special about herself. She has a real future as a contender for a championship fight. Um, now, after the fight, she nudges me and she says, twerking, coach, twerking? And I was like, oh, man, don't make me do this. Like, I just became crying to come president. These guys are going to freaking fire me, man. And she said, twerking and... and 
you know, I support my fighters all in. Like, all my friends, fighters, they're my family. Like, whatever they say, I'm all in with them. So, when she said twerking, I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Fuck I got in a handstand. Let's go. I didn't even do a regular twerk job. I got in a handstand, Beyonce. You know, <laughs> like, I was going to do a split, too. Went crazy. And then, uh, yeah, I twerked with my fighter. Now everyone knows me as the twerking coach. <laughs> 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 but I mean, it's yeah. remarkable. I mean, you know, you look, you talk about stories, creating memories. I, I spoke with uh, this fighter from Australia, Elliot Compton, about something. I feel like nowadays, you know, there's so much emphasis and stress on on the destination that the journey kind of becomes neglected. But I feel like with you, every individual fighter, you kind of categorize and highlight their journey in this sport. You know, showing them like, look, look, look at where you were maybe six, seven months ago. Look at where you are now. Look at the tremendous leaps and bounds you've taken. You talk about Francisco Prado. Young kid, 20, I think he's 21 now, you know, my age. And the fact that he's like, he went from traveling halfway across the world to Australia, rolling the dice on short notice against Jamie Malarkey of all people, you know, a great fighter. And then he comes back the next fight, you know, new camp or new gym, you know, is able to turn things around and be able to have one of the, I mean, you talk about performances. There's no doubting that at the age of like 21, that's probably the best KO of anybody in 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 the UFC at that age right now, you know it's undeniable. And then Eileen Perez, you know, you talk about the circumstances there. It makes for a hell of a story. Obviously, unfortunate set of circumstances, but it makes for a hell of a story. And that's in I feel like what everyone gets at the mixed martial arts for is the the journey of it. You know, where what it brings us as opposed to where it takes us. So I wanted to say like just in terms of on a final note, awesome because I wanted to thank you so much for your time, your authenticity. I feel like you're one of the most authentic kind-hearted you know just very transparent and open minds in our sport right now you know it's a pleasure and privilege to sit here and speak with you today i guess on a final note where does the journey go for president awesome in 2024 you know you look at all the things you've got going on go check karate combat you know coaching all these all these different dynamics you've got going on what does the journey kind of entail for you and mean to you and where, where what can we expect to see from you come the new year honestly um I always, I'm going to be completely honest. I say this humbly, man. I, I always knew we were going to be absurdly successful, Goach Chad and, and all this stuff. I didn't think it would happen this quickly. Everything's just skyrocketing. It's it's really insane. You know, I mean, going into next year, the objective, I have two main objectives. You know, karate combat, I think it already has solidified itself with this coming event. But it, it needs to be one of the greatest organizations in combat sports history. And it will be. And I think it's all on its way for that. So 2024, all of the combat sports world will be tuning in to every single KC event that we have. And then I'll make sure of that. You know, as far as go Chet, I've coached, I've been go Chet's uh, striking coach, wrestling coach, jiu-jitsu coach, strength and conditioning coach. I've been everything for go Chet since the start. I've never had any assistance at all. And that's all changed. Thank God. That's all changed. I need help. You know, I have 34 professional fighters. They're all fighting three to four times a year. I mean, that that's, that's a hundred events a year. You know, if everyone stays active, that's a hundred events. That's insane. So I need help. The problem is finding the right help. I got to say one of the biggest accomplishments as far as coaching for our gym, one of the biggest wins was actually getting um, a new coach involved. His name is, we call him Mango. He's from the jungles of Mexico. We pulled him out of Mexico. We brought him here. And just, if you know anything about Mexican culture and Mexican fighting, they, they have that heart of a lion, you know? So he brings that culture to my gym. And he's sort of my partner in the gym now. So we, we brought him uh, from Mexico. Oh, he's coaching my gym. He's the head striking coach in my gym. Him and I together are going to do unbelievable things in 2024. All, and also, I've hired a team of grappling coaches that will be helping with the, with the gym. So now, finally, my gym has a coaching staff of five or six coaches, me and Mango being the head coaches, to guide them into wins. So if, if we've been winning and being successful right now, I mean, I can't imagine with an actual coaching staff of five or six coaches where this is going to go. So you're going to see something really special. The team's the biggest it's ever been. And we're absolutely going to take over the world in the world of MMA. And then KC is going to take over the world in combat sports. No, yeah, definitely. You know, I can't wait to see it. And like you mentioned, uh, having a training staff and having a coaching staff, just uh, not yourself, just not you doing the whole thing. It's definitely got to alleviate a little bit of the pressure. I mean, amidst all the chaos, having guys you know you trust, back home able to help your guys be the best version of themselves be able to be with them when you can't be with them it's a remarkable feeling and i feel like it makes you all the more happy and confident in what you're building at goat shed and i'm i for one i'm very excited to see where goat shed goes where karate combat goes i'm actually going to be tuning in to maybe you know like you mentioned 
the effect of Awesome's AD, Pre President Awesome, Dana Brown, which, by the way, might be the three, be uh, the two best nicknames in all of combat sports, President Awesome and Dana Brown. Uh, they're Thank pretty, you, they're man. pretty freaking iconic, but, you know. Thank you. I really appreciate that, man. I got to say one thing, you know, you're talking about brands. One thing that's really important, and I, 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 everyone will know this. Anybody that knows me knows that I'm not saying this in a biased way. Karate Combat has to be one of the greatest organizations to blow up any fighter's brand. And I'll tell you why. Most organizations have everybody looking the same. Every fighter looks the same. It's hard to find out what's unique about them. Karate Combat pushes their athletes to find out who they are, who their brand is, what it is, and brings it to light. And there's no exception. Dude, you want to get crazy on your walkouts? You want to wear wacky things? You want the crazy content stuff? We embrace it. We embrace it. You know, most organizations... Stations, they don't want certain things. Everything's very, very formal because of TV uh, contracts or whatever it is. Here, Karate Combat's so open to you being yourself. And that's what I love about it. Because now everyone has creative freedom to express what they want and, and to brand themselves. You know what I mean? So I'm really, really excited for this organization. No, yeah, definitely. For me, you know, you look at what Karate Combat has done. Like for me, I tuned into, I think it was the Raymond Daniels, uh, the Raymond Daniels card. And that was a phenomenal card. But I feel like right now with this card... You look at Anthony Pettis, I feel like anything he touches really does turn to gold as of late. You know, you, you know, look at bare knuckle boxing, game bread boxing. You look at the Anthony Pettis fighting championship. I feel like you, when you have a great mind headlining your card uh, with a great mind behind the card, it's it sets up for great things. So I cannot wait for one to watch Benson Henderson and Anthony Pettis, tri the trilogy, the showdown of the century on Karate Combat. And also, I can't wait to see what you continue to do with Goatshed and with Karate Combat. Like you mentioned, unironically, you know, even before this interview, no, no bias, you know, uh, Karate Combat is making its waves in the sport as a whole. You know, you we talk about all, a lot of the times one championship, Bellator, you know, PFL, uh, Bellator RIP, but uh, PFL and, and whatnot. <laughs> You know, we talk about all these big promotions, but we never talk about like the, the the guys that are coming up in a completely unparalleled kind of unorthodox, you know, background. The Karate Combat, Bare Knuckle, FC, you know, a lot of these other promotions, we don't talk about them a lot. But I feel like we'll be talking about Karate Combat a lot in 2024. And awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to watching Karate Combat this upcoming weekend against, uh, you know, Anthony Pettis versus Benson Henderson. And I, I look forward to continuing to see what you do as a coach and as a person in this sport because you've been doing a great job. You've been making this sport a better place. And I look forward to seeing what you continue to build on. So thank you so much for your time. To the fans that I'm watching, I'll be linking the Karate Combat stuff in the description down below. I'm telling you right now, if, if it's, it's on Fight Pass, if you do not have Fight Pass, what are you doing first and foremost? No, it's not, on, it's fight not on Fight Pass. It's free on YouTube. Free on YouTube. Free on YouTube. Yeah, exactly. And you can, so you can go to karate.com and watch it there. Oh, or free on YouTube. And the vet, and which is crazy to say, right? You will never find a headline. Anthony Pettis versus Benson Edison free anywhere. So this is live free on YouTube. We're giving it to you, gifting it to you. Dana Brown's gifting it to you as president. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. You know, I cannot wait. You know, like you mentioned, I for, I thought for some reason it was on Fight Pass, but now, you know, now you mentioned it on YouTube, you know, that makes me even more excited for it. And knowing you can go and watch it literally at the at the comfort of, you know, you could be at a quinceanera, you can be wherever you want to be, and you could be watching this, you know. Uh, just, it doesn't matter where you are, when whenever it is. I feel like it's just easy when it's on YouTube. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I'll be linking the description hey. to the Karate Combat YouTube channel, guys. Do not be, do be sure not to miss it. It's been me, Dan, from Fight Wave. Thank you. Huge thanks to our sponsors for making this possible. And have a great day, guys.